As Chancellor, he argued it was necessary to break from a hundred years of Labour history to turn the United Kingdom into to break from a hundred years of Labour history to turn the United Kingdom into a paradise for the big business and the rich. He out Thatcher Thatcher and he turned London into a playground for the super rich. It was Gordon that left us at the mercy of the bankers and even in 2004 he praised Margaret Thatcher as the country's saviour who according to him recognised the need for Britain to reinvent itself and rediscover a new and vital self-confidence. Gordon's reappearance must remind us that it was Gordon who first raised the slogan British jobs for British workers, not UKIP, not BNP, not EDL, but Gordon Brown. And Gordon Brown can recycle Labour slogans if he wants, but in partnership with Tony Blair, he drove through New Labour's inhumane economic policy, breeding ignorance, despair and fear, which gave, us, which gave Scotland Tory rule once again. And last year, the monarchy, let me touch on that sensitive topic, despite the austerity cuts, the UK government was determined that us as a nation should celebrate the jubilee at an estimated cost of £3.6 billion. The Queen waved to us from a gold-plated million pound barge. 500 horses were actually flown into Windsor Castle at the cost of £40,000 each. And the Queen, she called it a humbling experience and hoped that memories of all this year's happy events would brighten our lives for many years to come. Now I'm sure my life and even more my parents who are pensioners would have their lives brightened if they got £180 million of state handouts yearly while stashing away £1.15 billion and given a £60 million a year heating allowance. So forgive me if I say this in black and white. I want the abolition of the monarchy in an independent Scotland. And I say this to a coalition of butchers, of liars, of hypocrites, of warmongers, that even if we got rid of the one Scottish Tory MP we have in Scotland, <laughs> nothing will alter the fact that Westminster will decide what happens to us in Scotland. From welfare to warfare, from economy to employment, we have no right to decide. We have no right to decide. And for far too long, the UK governments have exploited the politics of fear by bringing in tougher anti-terror laws, by cracking down on asylum seekers. And as a Muslim, I stand here and say this, I am tired of being told to demonstrate my Britishness. I am sick to the back teeth of being told by Westminster to do that. <laughs> Next September, we can win the vote for referendum. We can win the vote for independence and we can win it overwhelmingly. But only if we hold out a vision of a very different Scotland. We need to put anti-austerity at the heart of the Yes campaign. We need to fill our ranks with trade unionists and ordinary activists. And if ever there was an argument for independence, then it was Grangemouth. Jim Ratcliffe held to ransom not just thousands of workers, not just their families, not just entire communities, but the entire nation. Yet it was the country's largest democratic movement, the trade unions, that were scapegoated. When in fact it was Jim Ratcliffe's company that fled Britain's tax regime in 2010, that operates six tax havens around the world, that made a profit of £2 billion last year, yet for some reason workers at Grangemouth were criticised for having better pay and conditions than elsewhere. For some reason, it is unacceptable in modern Britain to have better paying conditions where the market is an endless race to the bottom. It wasn't the workers at Grangemouth who went on strike, it was the bosses who went on strike. They were the ones who had a pistol pointed at the heads of workers in Scotland. As the rich get obscenely richer in the United Kingdom, workers have faced the biggest fall 
in living standards since the reign of Queen Victoria. The crisis has become an opportunity to strip workers of security, of rights and power. Zero contract hours and temporary workers have become the norm. There are a number of choices that face us. And I say this, why should we be resigned to our economy being under the control of a handful? Why should a handful be able to threaten the future of entire nations from their hundred million pound yachts? Why should we accept that the stripping of rights and security from working people is the norm? And why should we be passive as wealth and power is shoveled in the direction of those who already have too much of this? In this room today and in Scotland, we all have different visions of what we want if we vote yes next September, but there is one cast iron guarantee I can give you. The people who live in Scotland will finally make that decision that affects Scotland. If we win next year, then Westminster will no longer have the right to dictate what we should think, what we should create, what we should produce. We will no longer be told we cannot govern ourselves from warfare to welfare, from employment to foreign policy, from cradle to grave. We will have the right to decide our destiny. I want to live in a nuclear free Scotland. I want a Scotland that stands as a beacon for human rights around the world. I want an end and an abolition of monarchy and I want a Scotland that rails against the Guantanamos and the illegal wars with a justice system that is worthy of a civilised society. And for all those embittered together that say that those sort of ideas and those visions that we will hear about today are a utopia, they're not a utopia. They are an alternative, they are a possibility, and the future of an independent Scotland must be a means for a bigger dream, and the radical independence movement is central to that. Thank you, brothers and sisters.